God 90, where we're not afraid of the tough biblical questions, because we will dig through the language, the culture, and the history to find the truth revealed in the words of our Creator. Hello, everyone. Thank you for letting us share part of your day. My name is Jerry Mitchell, your host for Give God 90. Sitting next to me this morning is Myra. Hi, everyone. She is back off of her mission, so that's a good thing. I want to uh, let everyone know that, uh, because we actually have a lot more new people all the time joining us. Uh, You can go to givegod90.com, check us out there, see what we're all about. Um, If you are interested, and it looks like a lot of you have been being interested, check out the books. We have two so far, one in production. <laughs> uh, Tradition to Truth is the first one. God's Universe, God's Rules is the second one. You can look for those wherever fine books are sold. Uh, if you're looking for a place where you can be charitable, and I'm not talking about donating to us, uh, there are people that we know that are looking for some assistance if you can help them in any way. One happens to be uh, a young lady who got a little bit behind because she was ill earlier that well, last year now, right? Right. It was mm-hmm. 2021. Uh, but, you know, in the United States, we get, well, it's not a, exactly a free education. They extort money for, from you in taxes to pay for uh, public education. But in other nations, they actually make you pay to go to school. They make you pay to wear their uniforms, all that kind of stuff. And they're having a little bit of trouble doing that in some places. So if you're looking to help some folks, some young people, uh, get an education that might be a good way to, to put that and there's other people out there that we know that need help as well so let us know what you're looking for and we can plug you into the right component is that right. a good way to say that mm-hmm. okay now the other night uh i was talking about processing information well, yeah pretty simple right somebody tells you something or you read something you hear something and then you have to decide what you're going to do with it well, today, I'm, we're going to look at uh, something that I've been asked about, and, and, and it's a very general question. Well, when I hear something, how do I know how to look at it? Is there a way that, you know, in general, I can figure this out, so to speak? And yes and no, but I'm going to use an example today. It's kind of off the charts just a little bit. Um, basically, what, what folks are asking me is if it's hard to understand, how do I get my head wrapped around it? How can I wrap my head around something that is so big sometimes, so large, that we can't process the information or we just we don't realize how something should work. And I'm going to start with something that a lot of people have trouble with. And that is at the size of the earth and the size of the universe. And I've talked about this a little bit before. Uh, today you might think you're getting a science lesson a little bit, but you're really not. Because what I'm going to hopefully show you is how to kind of apply uh into real life when you hear something how to kind of analyze it and how to say well if it's like this then it can be like that does that make sense okay you know how do how do you make these things kind of understandable i guess uh put them put them into perspective put them you know give yourself some real life application 
have you ever thought about how big creation it really is? I mean, really, it, it's it's not small. We people, especially today, you know, we talk about uh, the Earth's getting smaller. It seems like because there's more people in it, we're, we're close, more closely connected to people than we ever have been. Uh, Disney had the the ride. It's a small world, right? And anybody who's ever been to a Disney theme park that rides that ride for the next six months, they hear that song in their head. Or at least I did. <laughs> it was not mesmerizing for me. <laughs> if you're thinking about how large the Earth is, a lot of times we think in numbers, right? But before we get down to numbers... Let's look about. Let's think about a way we can actually get the sizes to fit. <clears throat> think about them in in a way that it's something you can actually see, holding your hand if you if you want to. And I'm going to use this kind of a strange analogy because most people are familiar with like a basketball or a soccer ball. They're about the same size, not really, but they're close. And if you hold Hold one up in front of your face. You close one eye, so you've only got one perspective to look at. And you hold it as close as you can and still kind of see the texture in the ball. and You, you know, you see the stitching and, and maybe the dimples, however, whatever kind of ball you're holding. And then as you slowly move it away, it begins to grasp a shape. Because if you're holding it real close and all you're looking at is those fine details, it looks kind of flat. But you know it's a ball, right? So as you begin to move it away, and you, you maybe you stop when you start to see the edge, and if you go just a little bit further, even if you're concentrating and focusing on the middle, your peripheral vision allows you to see eventually, the farther you move it away, the circle, right? You, you can't always see the, the the spherical aspect of it, but you can see the outline of the circle. And that usually happens normally about 7 inches or 17 centimeters. But for the average person, from the little bit of research I was able to do about this, uh, more like 10 inches or 25 centimeters. Okay, so you go from 0 to 10 inches or 25 centimeters. Now, how does that help us think about how big the Earth is? Well, you know, you, you have that thing in your hand and you move it away that amount. And you can see the outside of it. You see the circle. Well, the diameter of a basketball and I used a basketball instead of a soccer ball um, because well this is going to sound bad I just don't like soccer <laughs> but I, a lot of people do no problem with that I just never got into soccer the diameter of a basketball is about nine and a half inches about 24 centimeters the diameter of the Earth is about 7,900 miles or 12,700 kilometers, approximately. These are, I, I rounded things off to make them easier for me to do the math, okay? Now, what that means is a basketball is, get this, this is a really little number. A basketball is approximately 0. 0.00015. Now, if I remember right, that's uh, 15 ten thousandths of a mile, or 24 ten thousandths of a kilometer, 0. 0.00024 kilometers. Now, that's really, really, really small by comparison. So the 10 inches we move the basketball away, so you can see the inches, edges, I'm sorry, you know, 10, 10 inches or 25 centimeters, we can do a little bit of math, 
and we can think about this. See if we convert uh, these things to the metric system, it makes it a little bit easier this time because they deal in ten, tens, right? So you take the 0 0.00015 miles, or the 10 inches, and the 9.5 inches to the compared to the 7,900 miles, and you, we get a ratio. That is 25 centimeters to 24 centimeters is as, get this, this now this is a big number. This, is a, this number is bigger than I expected, to be honest with you. It is the same as 6,300 kilometers is to 12,700 kilometers. I know that sounds kind of funny, doesn't it? But for, for all the Americans out there, let me put this in a little bit of, of perspective. Um... The the, <laughs> the the distance, and I know I've got it here in my notes, uh, if we hold the ball away, that 10 inches is the same as holding, or, or you need to be about 4,000 miles above the earth so that you can see the circle of the entire earth. Okay? Now that's a, that's four thousand miles is a lot. Uh, four thousand miles is the about six thousand three hundred kilometers. So you have to be four thousand miles away from the Earth. That's how big the Earth is. So that ten inches that you're holding that basketball away from your face, so you can see just the outer ring, just where it starts. You've got to be about four thousand miles away. That's where the math works out to. Now, I've never been into outer space. I don't know. But that's how the math works. That's the ratio portions. I told you you were going to think you were in a science class for this. But that's how we have to think about things sometimes. We have to put them in perspective. You know, if I have this basketball and I move it away, how far from the Earth do I have to be to see, see the same thing? Now, if you ever think about flying in an airplane, if you fly in a plane, the average airplane flies somewhere around 30,000 feet. Not all of them. There's different traffic patterns up there. Different weather conditions call for different heights. In general, 30,000 feet. <laughs> that is about five and a half miles, just over nine kilometers. Now, we think that's a long way, but it's a long, long way from that 4,000 miles to see the edge of the Earth, right? The moon, by comparison, is about 240,000 miles away. So, imagine how big the moon must really be. If we can look out and see it, the size it is, and atmospheric conditions and things change it, yes, I know. But you look at the moon and think it's 240,000 miles away, and the Earth is much bigger than the moon. So is it any, is it any wonder when um, the astronauts look back and say, well, yeah, it does look like a big blue marble. The Earth looks like a big blue marble. I think that's kind of interesting. But here's what I want to do with this. I want you to think about how big our Creator must be. Because He's got to be big enough to be able to hold the earth and move away that 10 inches in comparison, you know, like we are holding a basketball, right? So how much bigger is, is He? Well, that's interesting. Because he's way bigger than that, even. Have you ever thought about how big the universe itself is? Now, we try to measure uh, the universe. And about the only way we can measure it is in something called light years. That's the distance that light travels in a year, we think. And 
I say that because the problem is we really don't know for absolute sure how far light travels in a year. We don't know the real speed of wet light. We have no way to measure the actual speed of light. We think we have a pretty good idea, but the reality is we just don't know. We measure reflected light. Now, isn't that amazing? Some of you have probably never heard that before. We can't, there is no scientific, reliable way to start a light at point A and be able to measure it, you know, uh, a year down the road at point B. We can't even start a light at point A and measure it a mile away accurately. What we have to do is we measure light from point A, we send it out, it hits a mirror or a reflective surface, and then it comes back. And then we take the average. Right? Now, does that light travel faster as it goes out? Or does it travel faster as it comes back? Think about a baseball. The pitcher throws the baseball, and when the bat hits that ball, that energy comes back out, and the ball's traveling faster as it reflects off the bat. Is that the way light works? We don't know because we can't measure it that way. And I'm saying all this to give you an idea of how big this is. Now, now reflected light travels at 186,282 miles per second. Or, for everyone not living in the United States, uh, 229,792 kilometers per second. But that's not light in a straight line. That's reflected light. Because we really don't know how to measure over such a long distance like that, we have to try to imagine. In other words, we guess. We guess. The distance from one side of our universe to the other side is still small enough, and I want you to think about this, it's small enough that our Creator can hold it in His hands like a basketball, like we would hold a basketball. And you want to doubt your Creator. Amazing. <clears throat> Here is where I'm going with this. Our Creator holds his creation in his hands. He controls it. He manipulates it. He does what he wants it to do for his glory, for his purpose. He doesn't do it for us. He does it for himself. Now, he's not really that arrogant to say, oh, look what I can do. I've got all of this. If he, if he was like that, well, we'd just be a bunch of mind-numbed robots and it wouldn't matter. But instead, he does it. He puts us out there. He puts all the stars and all of creation out there. And David has a really interesting way of looking at this. And that's what brings us to Psalm 24. Now, it's only 10 verses as Meyer reads Psalm 24. <clears throat> the earth and everything in it belong to the Lord. The world and all its people belong to him. He built it on the waters. He set it on the rivers. Who may go up on the mountain to the Lord? Who may stand in his holy temple? Only those with clean hands and pure hearts. They must, have, must not have worshipped idols. They must not have made promises in the name of a false god. It is they who will receive a blessing from the Lord. The God who saves them will declare them right. They try to follow God. They look to the God of Jacob for help. Open up your gates. Open wide, you aged doors. Then the glorious king will come in. 
Who is the glorious king? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, the powerful warrior. Open up your gates. Open wide, you aged doors. Then the glorious king will come in. Who is the glorious king? The Lord of heaven's armies. He is the glorious king. David chooses some very interesting language here. And it, it talks about a glorious king. And he follows along with some other things that he does. He looks at creation and he says that all of creation displays the glory. And he continues with that through a lot of his writing. Now, when a king rules, he rules over everything. He doesn't rule over just the people. He doesn't rule over just the land. But everything. Everything that happens during his reign on the throne is something that he controls. Hebrew blessings typically will begin with the same phrase. Baruch Atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Only when the Jewish folks say it, they will not say Yehovah. They will say either Adonai, Hashem, something like that. The translation, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the Universe. Hmm. It's interesting that the word translated as universe, olam, it's a Hebrew word often translated as forever. We really don't have an English equivalent that I am aware of anyway. Our creator not only reigns over the physical, he reigns over the abstract, he, he reigns over time, everything. It's all inclusive. His reign is forever and over everything. And it's, Olam is really the only way uh, to describe that. It's all-encompassing time, all-encompassing space and physical matter, all-encompassing spirit. You name it, our Creator has rule over it, whether you want to believe that or not. He is the one uh, who sits on the throne. He is the one who has rule and control. And it takes a very, very big God to do that. And he is the only one. David writes in verse 8, Who is the king of glory? And he answers himself right away. And it is, if you read it in Hebrew, it's named. He's named, I should say. Uh, who is this king of glory? Yehovah, strong and mighty. Yehovah. Mighty in battle, repeats it, making sure we know. And and he repeats himself again. Who is the King of Glory? Jehovah. The King, Jehovah of Hosts, Jehovah, King, ruler of sovereign of heaven's armies. He is King of Glory. Isn't that amazing? That David, uh, when he was writing this, what, just a little more than 3,000 years ago now, he didn't have all the scientific equipment we have today to measure things with. He didn't have all the stuff that we have today that we can look at and, and be all sciencey. He just looked around, saw creation for what it is, understood that creation was created to glorify the Father, and said, oh, this is how this works. It didn't matter to him that when he looked at the moon, he was 240,000 miles away. It didn't matter to him that if he had to stand back and look at the earth, that he would have to be 4,000 miles away to do it. It didn't matter to him because he was able to put things into perspective not from the way man sees it, but from the way the Creator sees it. David's revelation in Psalm 24 describes to us 
he understood how mighty, how majestic the Creator is. His use of the word glory, strong, mighty, that shows us that nothing is as large or as powerful or as majestic or as great as our King. You know, the, the, the one Father in Heaven that designs each of us in His image and get this, so that we can reflect His light. We're made in His image. We get to reflect His light. Now, just like the speed of light can't be measured, the King of Glory can't be measured. He's too big. He's too immense. But when we reflect His light, the way we live, the way we're designed to live, Here's where it gets a little complicated. We have to absorb that light in order to reflect it. You see, light doesn't reflect off the surface of the mirror. Light reflects off the back of the mirror. Did you realize that? The surface, the polished piece, even, even a polished piece of metal, that light has to be absorbed and then sent back out. And we do the same thing because we're made in the image. We reflect that light. We have to absorb it first and then we can reflect it. And the only way that we can absorb it and reflect it is when we really learn to live the way we're designed to live. When it comes to understanding the really big things, we, put, we need to put them into perspective but we need to put them into the proper perspective. We need to, to stop measuring things the way man measures them sometimes. And we need to think about them the way that our Creator designed us to think about them. Does it matter how far the moon is? Does it matter how far above the earth you have to be to see the circle of the earth? No, it doesn't matter. Because what we do is we understand His glory in all of that. Is it kind of neat sometimes to think about that? Yeah, it is. There was something I was going to look up and I didn't look it up. I was going to, to think about if you could walk from the North Pole to the South Pole, which is impossible to do, by the way. But if you could, how long of a distance is it? How long would it take you to walk that distance? And the reason I thought about that was to give a, a little bit of an idea of how big the planet we live on really is. Because I don't think we really understand. And because we don't understand how big it is, we don't really understand how great and majestic the Almighty can be. What does it take for a creator to create something that he uh, so that we think is is huge, right? but it's small enough for him to hold in his hands. It can be fun. It can be distracting to think about things like that. But how you put things into perspective a lot of times will help you gain that understanding. And in looking at the size of the earth, the size of the universe, understanding that reflected speed of light, understanding that we have to absorb it in order to reflect it back out. Does it really matter? You know, light, even a dim light, you might think that it's absorbed by darkness. And to a, a degree in the physical realm, it can be. But in the spiritual realm, it never is. When you reflect the light that your Creator put in or shines on you, let's put it that way, because that's that's the way it's it's told in Scripture. When you reflect the light that is shined onto you, it will go forever. Olam. It never stops. That's the way we need to think about these things sometimes. We need to stop trying to put things in, in little compartment boxes 
because some things just won't fit there. Psalm 24, I think, is a really good example of that. I mean, David's use of the words majestic, mighty, powerful, glorious. It's kind of a shame that we don't use those words sometimes in their most pristine usage. I mean, we kind of, well, as we do what people do, you know, we, we sort of allow things to evolve, allow language to evolve, allow uh, the, the definitions to evolve. We change it to what suits us at the time. But in the original, we can see what it really is. When it comes to understanding the really big, big things, let's stop measuring them by things that are limited, things we don't know, things we have to guess at. Maybe we should start measuring the really big things in the reflection that our Creator is in each of us. The best way to do that is to live the way you're designed to live. Does that make, did I make, take that complicated enough and have it make a little bit of sense? Yes. I did? Okay. If it makes sense to you, it makes sense to a lot of people. Because, <laughs> you know, I'll admit a lot of people don't think the way I do, and that's okay. Did you have anything you wanted to add to all of that? No, it's been an honor to be with you today, and we'll see you on Thursday. Yep, until Thursday, we wish you many, many blessings.